Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib, and it's time once again for your weekly wrap-up. And this week I thought we would talk about the holy grail of personal computing, and that of course are fully functional handheld PCs, including PCs that you can game on, like the newly announced Steam Deck from Valve. Uh, but of course, this handheld PC is not the first one. I've looked at a bunch of them over the years, so I thought we would take a look at what's been done previously, why the Steam Deck is interesting to me, and why I don't think it's going to be a big competitor to the Nintendo Switch. Let's get to it. Now, of course, the concept of handheld PCs are nothing new. Uh, this is an HP handheld that I've got here in my hand from 2014. They were selling these at one point for $100. They were powered by an Atom processor, and that allowed it to run most Intel applications within reason on these little handheld devices. They were not very fast. You couldn't play a lot of games on this, for example, but it did mobile games just fine, and it could run the regular version of Microsoft Office and Excel and everything else. You could install uh, Chrome and whatever else you needed on this little device. There was even a docking station that I reviewed for this that turned it into a desktop PC. And it was really amazing when I first started doing this channel to be able to buy something so inexpensive that was a full-fledged Windows computer that fit in your hand. Unfortunately, these things didn't sell very well, which is why we don't see many Windows tablets like this anymore. But it was a thing. And you can check out my full playlist here of a bunch of other devices that I've reviewed over the years that could fit in the palm of your hand, yet run a full installation of Windows. There's also a lot of crowdfunded efforts that have had varying degrees of success. Uh, this one is one of the active ones at the moment called the Aya Neo, and this is running with an AMD processor similar to what is going into the new Steam Deck from Valve, but this is running with the regular 4500U processor we've seen in a lot of laptops lately. And then, of course, there are a lot that didn't succeed, yet still took people's money. Uh, the Smack Z is an example of that. I was one of the Kickstarter backers of this thing, and it's been dying a slow death over the last three or four years, and they finally put it out of its misery, and everybody lost their money, as what usually happens with these projects. This is not an easy thing to build, so I would never suggest to anyone uh, to contribute into a Kickstarter or Indiegogo for a product like this unless the company is extremely trustworthy and has a track record. I'll show you one of those companies in a minute. But the Smack Z was something that I lost some money on and unfortunately will not be getting back. But beyond the tablet PC we just looked at, we haven't seen much in the way of handheld PCs from the big name manufacturers. After those cheap tablets didn't work out, I don't think they had much of an appetite to pursue the market. But at CES in 2020, we did take a look at the Dell Alienware UFO, and this was being shown off in their uh, press area at the show. And a lot of excitement was built around this device because it reminded a lot of people of the Nintendo Switch and all the things that made the Switch successful. But this was a full PC running with an Intel processor. I think it was likely a Tiger Lake chip, and it had all of the same features you would expect from a Switch in that it was dockable. I had a Thunderbolt 3 port on it though, so you could conceivably hook up an external GPU. The game controllers, as you can see, detach and you can use them separate from the unit when it was docked. So there was a lot of cool features that this was going to bring into the marketplace if it ever came to fruition. And of course, at the moment, it is not a shipping product, but it felt very complete to me. It didn't feel like a prototype so much as it was kind of a late development uh, device. So we'll have to see if this ever comes out and what it might cost, but clearly Dell is thinking about this and apparently Valve was as well. Now the one company that has been successfully shipping mini PCs over the years is a company called GPD, Gamepad Digital. They're based out of Shenzhen, China, and whenever I go to CES I try to find these guys because they always have something cool in the works. And the first product that I looked at from them uh, was this one. This was their uh, first handheld PC, and as you can see, it has game controllers on it, a little keyboard. It was running with an Atom processor. I'm pretty sure this was maybe a step above the processor that was in that HP, 
and it wasn't all that useful from a gaming perspective. It could play games. I'll show you uh, Grand Theft Auto V running on it, but this was running at like 800 by 600 resolution at the absolute lowest settings, and we were able to get maybe 20 frames per second out of it. So it wasn't all that useful as a direct handheld gaming device, but it was close to it, and it was interesting to see that there was some utility for this device, and a lot of folks found it to be intriguing. Uh, the last device we looked at from them was this one. This is the GPD Win Max. This is running with a 10th generation Intel processor. I'll put a link down below to the review that I did of it so you can see exactly what it's capable of. It's big, it's not quite handheld, uh, but this is the kind of device that an IT professional might find of use because it is a full Windows 10 PC, of course, running with that 10th generation processor. It's got Thunderbolt 3 on board. Uh, in the review, I think we hooked up an external GPU to this. It really is a pretty powerful laptop that you can carry around with you. And although it is big for gaming, it's not big for other kinds of tasks. But GPD has been working on something that's a little more handheld. Uh, this is the GPD Win 3, which I believe now is shipping. And this is running with the current Tiger Lake generation of processors, so it can do very well on games. It has a really neat cooling system. It is expensive, though. It costs twice as much as what Valve is going to be selling their top-of-the-line unit for. But if you want something that's handheld and can play games, this you can get, I think, right now uh, for about 1200 bucks with the i7 on board. Not cheap, but if you wanted something this portable that could play PC games, uh, they've got one, and it's a really cool design. It's got the uh, flip-up screen so you can get at a physical keyboard underneath it. It's got the game controllers. It has Thunderbolt 3 built in so you could dock it and hook up an external GPU. So there is something to this device. I'm going to try to get one, I think, if I can get them to lend me one for a review at some point. Again, very expensive. You have to really be committed to handheld PC gaming, I think, to spend as much as this thing costs, especially given what Valve will be offering theirs for but it's probably the coolest looking device they've put together to date. And that brings us to the Valve Steam Deck, and I keep getting it confused with the Stream Deck from Elgato, which is a device a lot of us content creators use. I haven't taken mine out of the box yet, but one of these days I'll get to it. I was hoping they would call it the Steam Pal, which was the initial name of it. I thought that was a nice homage to the Game Boy, but maybe they thought it was too close to that. The specs here look great. It's got an AMD Zen 2 derived processor, so that would presumably give you performance similar to what we've seen out of some of those 4500U laptops we've looked at in the recent past. And those laptops all could play a number of AAA games at playable frame rates at 720p, and that's the display this is running with, which I think is the right target. It's got 16 gigabytes of very fast RAM, so that should be a good pairing with that processor. Those AMD chips really like fast dual channel memory, and this will have that. The upper two models in the line have NVMe storage on board, so it should deliver those games very quickly. But as far as I can read so far, it's only USB type C, not Thunderbolt, and that's going to limit your ability to use an external GPU, if not eliminate the ability to use an external GPU. There's just not enough bandwidth over that USB-C connector to allow that to happen. So it would be great if they could integrate Thunderbolt in some way. I think it would make it a killer product because you could dock it and make it more powerful when you did. But the price is right on this thing. Uh, $649 for the top of the line unit with the 512 gigabyte NVMe on board is very competitive compared to some of the other handheld PCs that are out there. Clearly, I think they're looking at this as a gateway into the Steam library and all the money they make off the game sales there, but we'll talk about what I think a lot of people want to use it for in a minute that does not involve anything that Valve is offering. One thing that I'm not happy with is the controller placement. That little pad below the thumbstick there is one of those capacitive pads that Valve has been building into their products for a while now. I've never been crazy about this in anything that I've used of theirs. That includes the VR controllers and the old Steam controller. Uh, so it would be nice for them to find a more comfortable position, I think, for that directional pad. And the same can be said of the buttons, which are in a really weird spot 
on the edge of the controller. That just doesn't look comfortable to me. Now, of course, short of holding it in my hand, I can't say exactly how this feels, but I just don't like the way it looks. And I think a lot of other gamers feel the same way. And I guess this is still kind of an early design idea, so they might uh, flesh this out a little bit more in the near future, and let's hope they do that. Otherwise, we're all gonna have to go and get some uh, work done in our hands for uh, carpal tunnel syndrome or something. Now, this new hardware is not running Windows. It will be running Steam OS, which is a Linux operating system that boots up to Steam. In the early days, this was nice because it was highly optimized just for game playing, but there wasn't a lot of games available because unless the developer ported the game to Linux, it didn't work. Uh, now Steam has some software technology to provide a compatibility layer to get Windows games running on Linux through their Steam OS. I haven't tried it recently, but I'd love to hear from some of you who have. But I do think a lot of folks would prefer just to have it running with Windows, which is allowed. So apparently you can just install Windows on this thing and get yourself a full-fledged Windows computer that can run Steam, but also other game libraries like Xbox Game Pass. And this is what I've been seeing the most excitement about, is that you could have your Game Pass games downloading to this portable system that you can take on the road with you. I don't think this is what Valve had in mind when they priced this product. I think they priced it very close to cost so that people would be buying more Steam games from the device itself. But it looks like I think a lot of gamers, the target market for this device, uh, will be savvy enough to get that operating system off and put Windows on to get a better layer of compatibility and, of course, have more gaming options available to them. Now, a lot of people are also calling this the Switch Killer. And from a hardware specification standpoint, definitely. But from a market perspective, is it really? I don't think so. Let's take a look at what the Switch has done to date. They've sold 84.5 million consoles worldwide since it came out a few years back. But on the first day, they had over a million consoles delivered to customers. Now, if we take a look at uh, the folks from SteamDB who were able to get a feel for the uh, pre-orders that were being done on the Steam platform through their access to their database, it looks as though uh, they only sold 104,000 of these through the pre-orders that started a couple of days ago. Now, granted, there was a lot of problems with the system taking those orders. I had to spend the better part of an hour clicking the button over and over again until they would give me my $5 deposit. I did order the 512 gigabyte version, so hopefully in a year or two, we'll get one in and play around with it. But we've never really seen a Valve hardware product become something that general consumers adopt at a level that we see with the Switch and other more consumer-oriented items. Let me show you a few examples of the hardware that they've put out, put out over the last couple of years. Uh, this is the Steam controller. I've got, I think, one of these kicking around still. And it was a neat idea. They had those capacitive pads versus some more physical control surfaces on it. They had some really neat integrations with the uh, Steam system so you could share your configurations with other players and try to find the one that worked best for the game that you were playing. A lot of cool things that you could tweak, but it wasn't a very comfortable or very intuitive gamepad. I think people like a more traditional thing like uh, what we looked at the other day with the Backbone where you've got physical controls versus virtual ones. Uh, they also had something called the Steam Link. Uh, this sold okay, but I don't think it sold like gangbusters. This allows you to hook a little device up to your television and stream games from your gaming PC over your local network. Uh, but of course, many TVs now just integrate the app in them, so you don't need the hardware anymore. Uh, a couple of years ago, we looked at one of the Steam machines. These were hardware devices that Valve uh, developed alongside some name brand hardware manufacturers. This was the Alienware Steam machine that we reviewed. It was a nice piece of hardware, but it was running Steam OS, and most of the games that people wanted to play were not available on Steam OS. They were only working on Windows. So a lot of folks just took uh, Steam OS off completely and put Windows on it, uh, which kind of, I think, defeated the purpose of a Steam branded computer. Uh, also, they were not very upgradable which is something that a lot of gamers would like to see. And the cost on these was much higher than the Xboxes and the Playstations at the time. Uh, they also have their VR headset called the Valve Index. I bought one of these and did not have a good experience with it. 
A lot of enthusiasts really love the index. It has a high frame rate display, uh, but I had some optical issues with it, perhaps just how it interacted with my eyes in a way that I did not experience with any other VR headset that I have tried over the years, and I've tried a lot of them, and I just found it to not really be worth the purchase price, although I know there's a lot of folks out there who are quite happy with it. And the Valve Index kind of embodies, I think, the challenges that Valve has in attracting a larger consumer audience. They are making products by enthusiasts for enthusiasts, and those don't often translate into a mass consumer appeal. And the index here didn't really solve the problems that consumers had with virtual reality in that you need a powerful computer, you need to get sensors set up, you've got to get all these things configured before you can even turn the thing on. And I think that turned off a lot of consumers. And if you take a look at Valve's own data insofar as which headsets are being used on the Steam VR platform, the Oculus Quest 2, uh, which came out after the index, is running at about 31% of the share, followed by the Rift S. Both are very easy products to set up and use. So those have about over 50% of the market share on Valve's own platform versus the hardware that they put together, which is running at about 16%. Although you could make the argument that the HTC Vive uh, has a lot of Valve hardware in it as well, but still, uh, Oculus is kind of running the show here because their hardware is more appealing to consumers and they're adopting them in high numbers. In fact, the other night I was playing with my Oculus Quest 2 uh, because they added a new feature that allows you to use the headset with your PC over your local Wi-Fi network and it works great at 90 hertz. It's amazing and I think that's the kind of stuff that consumers want. Simplicity and ease over superior hardware. And you can also look at what Nintendo's strategy has been in the past because the Game Boy was overpowered by all of its competitors almost from day one. The Atari Lynx was out around the same time and it was incredible. It had hardware scaling, color, it looked and played great, but the battery life was lousy, it was more expensive, and it didn't have the game library. And you can make the argument also against the Turbo Express, which had a great game library but a high cost. The game Gear, which had a pretty good library but low battery life, all of those things just could not beat the Game Boy, which enjoyed almost a decade of market dominance before they revved the hardware to something more powerful. And I think Nintendo is very disciplined in how they approach these things. And they're seeing that people are still buying their games in huge numbers. Take a look at the sales charts here. Uh, Animal Crossing New Horizons is the number two best-selling Switch game of all time, and that only came out last year. It was kind of the perfect uh, pandemic lockdown game, I guess, but this is an example, I think, of what consumers are buying in large numbers, and Nintendo looks at this and says, where is the end to the demand for this system? People are still buying every game we put out by the tens of millions, and these are games that are exclusive to the Nintendo console, so they have a lot of I think potential left in the Switch hardware to go, which is why when they announced their new OLED model, it wasn't any more powerful because it doesn't need to be right now. Consumers are happy with what they're currently offering, even though us hardware gurus want more power. And one other thing that might be a factor here is the rise of mobile streaming. Uh, Xbox, of course, has integrated streaming into their Game Pass Ultimate subscription, and I've been playing around with it quite a bit over the last few months, and I've been enjoying it, actually, especially now that I've got a low-latency controller to go with it. This, again, is the backbone, but we also looked at the Razer Kishi the other day that is also a low-latency controller. And it's not a bad experience. Is it as good as having a robust handheld in my hand that can run the game locally with zero latency? No, but it's close enough in many cases. And for a lot of games that don't have a lot of demand for a low latency kind of uh, connection, it might be good enough. And I think a lot of consumers will be looking at a $50 or $100 game controller for their phone as a better alternative than a $650 portable PC that won't have as much battery life. So we'll have to see how all this plays out, but I don't think the Steam Deck is going to dominate the Switch by any means, but I do think it will be the most successful hardware product that Valve has ever made, and I am certainly excited to get one as an enthusiast, but I think we should keep our expectations in check here this is not going to lead to a rise of an entire new segment of the PC market. I don't think there's enough buyers out there to support it. 
But again, I think there is enough business out there for Valve to have a successful product especially based on how they price this one. Now, I'm sure a lot of you will have opinions on this, so definitely let me know down in the comment section what you think, and we'll discuss further. Now, this week's wrap-up is being brought to you by all of you, and we have a new Gold Level supporter, Handheld Obsession. Thank you very much for your generous contribution. And we also had a nice generous contribution from Michael Richard, who became a YouTube member this week using that join button down below. And if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel through my donor box page. We also support that YouTube membership program and I am up on Floatplane, uh, which is where I also upload all of my content to. Additionally, you can find me on Amazon at lon.tv slash Amazon shop, along with a few other places here, including an audio version of this show that I release every week as a podcast on Wednesdays. If you want to engage with the channel, you can go to lon.tv slash email and get an occasional email delivered to you. And we've got some big event coming up. We also have my Facebook group at lon.tv slash Facebook group, where you can interact with me and other fans of the show. And then we've got my store where I sell previously used items. And we also just launched a Discord. It's kind of in a beta phase at the moment. Uh, Brian Parker and Mark Dell, fans of the show, have been helping me get that going. You can go to lon.tv slash Discord to check it out. I've got to spend a little bit more time with it, but I will be popping in from time to time. And by the way, if you are looking for a good deal on things that I've previously reviewed here on the channel, head over to my store alert email page where I will send out an email to you every time I add something to the store. And there's usually one of everything. And these are items that I purchased to review and I'm now reselling. And I put three things up over the weekend and they all went like that. So definitely uh, sign up on that email list if you would like to be notified whenever we add a used item to the store. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. Thank you all for your continued support and comments and all the other great things you do to help this channel continue growing. I will be back again next week with another wrap up and I'll have a bunch of product reviews going on throughout the week and that'll do it. So I will see you soon and until next time, this is Lon Zybin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, Jim Callagher, Hot Sauce and Video Games, and Brian Parker. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.